Hello and welcome to the Game Football Podcast from The Times. It's only six games into this Premier League season, but we're already starting to ask some pretty big questions. Are chaotic Chelsea really title contenders? Is 17-year-old Ethan Wanieri a future Arsenal superstar? And is it about time we just accept that Manchester United are a mid-table team at best and stop losing the plot every time they're beaten at home? All of that. Plus, we'll talk about a big win for Everton, Brentford, Manchester City and table-topping Liverpool. And joining me, Tom Clark, for all of that, we have the senior sports writer and Sunday Times columnist Alison Rudd, the football reporter and analyst Hamza Kalik Lunat and a former footballer turned writer Gregor Robertson is here as usual. Team, how are we? Feeling Feeling a little fresher than me? (laughs) Undoubtedly. You sound a little bit (laughs) croaky. Yes, a little croaky. I've got a bit of a cold which I made worse by going on my <laughs> stag do this a weekend. Cold in inverted commas. <laughs> I did have a cold, and then I went on my stag do and made it a lot worse. Oh, so it's the cold, though. It's the cold, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely the cold. <laughs> Nothing to do with the stag do, which it was a lovely, wholesome time, just with some lovely lads having a nice fun. That was all it was. And now I'm back to talk about some football with you guys, which is anything. It's more more chaotic than a stag do most of the time. <laughs> um, and speaking of chaos, we should pro- we're going to have to start with Manchester United, aren't we? We have to even despite my opening where I thought I could be you know, really alternative and just throw it in as a question at the end. Man United, what do you reckon? Good win for Tottenham, end. Uh, a poor performance at Old Trafford, again. Eric Ten Hag's future is being discussed, again. We're asking poor Paul Hurst to work out how they can improve. Hursty, what can you talk about, again? <laughs> they lost a home to a fellow rival for the top six. What's the big deal? What's the big deal, Alison Rudd? What's the big deal? The big, the big deal is Ten Hag, isn't it? Because he's he's yet to convince my. Uh, you, you very kindly mentioned my Sunday Times column. My Sunday Times column this week was to preview this match, in which I said I, I don't think that Ten Hag is brave enough to stick with Christian Eriksen in midfield, because when he has played him this season, they've actually looked cohesive. He's a good leader on the pitch, Eriksen. He's a grown up. His passing is excellent, but having um, probably their best midfield performance of the season, which was at Crystal Palace, which was all led by Christian Eriksen, really crisp, short, mixing it, then mixing up passing, really good passing, led by him. Um, Eriksen then came out after the draw with 20 and said quite bluntly that 20 wanted it more than Man United, and that can't be right, can it, he said. And I thought, ah, he's going to get dropped now. He's going to get dropped because he was most visibly at fault for the 20 equaliser, although it wasn't entirely Ericsson's fault. The whole the whole team parted like the Red Sea. And um, But that what, what, what worried me was that Ericsson being... You know, Ericsson doesn't care, does he? he, he, he the manager, he, he didn't seem to care whether the manager would think that was uh, disrespectful or he sh- whether he should be saying such things or not. I thought, ah, he's not gonna, he's he's gonna drop him. Sure enough, he drops him, and there is no midfield. There's no passing. M- mainly, Man United either tried to bypass midfield altogether with long balls, or they passed to Spurs players. So I mean, there's been a m- no midfield for Manchester United many times with Christian Eriksen in that midfield. But this season, they had started to look cohesive with him there. So why not keep him going? Why not keep going the bits that are metronomic and working? Why mix it up yet again? I mean, this is the other thing. You never know what you're going to get with Ten Hag, who he's going to pick. What, um, and we don't know the reasons why he picks them. It seems to be very ad hoc, which isn't what you do if you're the manager of Manchester United, I'd have thought. Speaking of their midfield, I've just just noticed uh, Paul Hurst's ratings. I mentioned Hurst at the top of the show. Paul Hurst, now I've got to say, I don't really like ratings because they just wind people up. But we ask, we, really as ed- wind people up. we as editors ask you guys to do them because they're occasionally good fun and Paul Hurst is the best in the business. I love all of you. You're all great. You're all wonderful writers. You bring so much to the Times team. Hurst's ratings are the best. Diego Dallo, three. Mateus Delic three, Lissandro Martinez four, Masrawi three, and speaking of midfield, Manuel Ugarte, the new midfielder who's going to solve everything, three and hooked for Christian <laughs> Eriksen. Uh, Hamza, Manuel Ugarte, is someone that you've spoken about. You asked, listen, you asked for it, mate. You asked to talk about Manuel Ugarte and Manchester United fans and some of the views that you've had. So I just thought I'd tee you up. Let's get going. Let's really ramp it up. Uh, yeah, it's, um, after the uh, Southampton match, I, I wrote that um, he's not a solve all solution for Manchester United because the issues that they have are structural the way that they play I think we discussed this on the podcast a few weeks ago for example the way that they build up because they have a 3-1 structure and the 6 is ahead of them the 6 forwards are ahead of them which means that if that one player loses the ball suddenly you're one on one 
uh, on the counter, which is what te- um, Arna Slot spoke about and uh, is a common theme for Manchester United, and we, we saw it in this match. Uh, and I said, Agate doesn't fix that because he wins the ball and he sort of passes sideways a lot. And uh, United fans were quite upset about this. I remember after I was um, at the Champions League match in Milan, um, around, it was around 11.30 at night there, and so 10.30 here, I got a message on Twitter. Uh, and someone had sent me Manuel Lagarde highlights against Barnsley, so <laughs> <laughs> seven nil. And I thought, oh god! People forget about yes. seven nil. And I thought, oh, <clears throat> you've got me there. <laughs> you've, uh, you've 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 taken my piece, which is about a very specific thing about how he doesn't pass forwards, and turned it into something else, and taken the highlights against Barnsley, who aren't Championship level, they aren't Champions <laughs> League level. And honestly, so I, I watched that match and I enjoyed it, um, the, the match in Milan because it's Champions League level. However, I enjoyed seeing that tweet more. It was, <laughs> I, I, I was crying. With, it doesn't sound like it, but I was actually crying. I suggest with you need to get your priorities it, in order. It was it? very, very funny. Um, and, right. and then Going I'll, back to this game, yeah, Andrew yeah. Garte and Manchester United's mm. midfield and some of the points that Alison has made. We're trying, to, we're trying desperately to look at new ways to talk about Manchester United. Mm. But, I mean... Oh, uh, your your gets your turn in a minute, mate. It's so. not just the midfield either. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, the def- it's never a great sign, Greg. I don't know much about football. You played the game, but it's, I wouldn't say it's a great sign when an opposition centre back is allowed to run through the entire team in the third minute. I don't suggest that you'd necessarily bang up for the game at home if that happens in the third minute. As no, good or, as the run was from Van der Ven, yes. great run. But or when Marcus Rash- Marcus Rashford just elected to com- you know just completely jump out of any possible challenge or whatever yeah. mm. in the build up before it or run back afterwards okay, you want to caught him because Van Veen is really quick and it was brilliant it was thrilling to watch that but yeah the the Licht looks like you know this, this is the problem everyone who comes into Manchester United suddenly looks like we they're going to get sucked into the vortex we said this at the start of the season didn't we De Ligt in a high line he can't really do that anymore it's yeah. like they got they have Harry Maguire and they identified certain problems with him and, and he's in their play style, playing with a high line, whatever. And they went, oh, why don't we just get another Harry Maguire? <laughs> and Harry Maguire's very good and Delict's very good. But in this specific system where you're covering these transitions, uh, that's quite a lot to ask for. And uh, another thing as well, so I wrote about this very briefly on in Saturday's paper. Um, they have strikers that don't shoot. Um, it's totally bizarre to me. that, that So they, they identified that they needed strikers. They bought Hoyland. He averages less than two shots a game. He just doesn't shoot very much. And they got Xerxes, who's um, very good at linking up play, but also doesn't shoot very much. If you don't shoot very much, surprise, surprise, you're not going to score very much. Um, and I mean this in a totally like sincere way. Uh, if you aren't shooting that often as a striker, that means you often get on the wrong end of variance. If you, just got, if you have two shots a game, you need to score one of them. If you have three shots a game, you need to score one of those. But it, it, it's a bit more forgiving, right? Yeah. And a good striker should be in that range of between three and maybe five. Once you start pushing beyond five, you actually have diminishing returns because you're taking shots away from other teammates. But if you've got two guys that don't take many shots at all, that's a problem. So while, while Holland has, has great qualities in running behind, he doesn't actually get many shots for that. And United fans listening to this may say that's that's a consequence of the system. It's not making very much. But these stats, and to, to some degree, I... <clears throat> I agree. Stats are sort of um, emergent. If you play for a good team, you get good stats. But these stats, shooting, is something that's sort of inherent to a striker. It's a, it's a characteristic of them. Uh, and while Xerxes has great link-up play and Hoyland has great running in behind, neither of them shoot very much. So you need the wingers to do that. And Rashford isn't shooting. Garnacho shoots a bit, but he's not like Ronaldo mm. in terms of like wing. I'm using Ronaldo as an example because he's a high-volume shooter that used to shoot on the wing and then moved to centre forward. So you, you've got just glaring recruitment issues. Like, why would you sign a Garte if he can't do the number six job? We discussed this before. Like, if you're trying to build a system where you can only play with Rodri, but Mod- but Rodri's across the road at Manchester City, what are you doing? Like, think of some better... So who's stri- that then? Is that Ten Hag? But obviously there's a lot been made about, you know, change... change. So just, it's okay, mate. We can <laughs> so, it. It's okay. It was the same again. Like, you, you heard in commentary yesterday as well, like, like Guy Neville made a very valid point saying this is his team now as well. This is his team. Yeah. It should never be his team. Mm. Like that That's another glaring issue. Like you, you shouldn't allow the manager to build his team. There should be more like... But is that not partly <laughs> the failing of, you know, Omar Barada, Dan Ashworth, all the oh, big... Come on, you they know. just walked through the door. Yeah, look, they've, they, they, made a dis- this they made a decision they in the summer. summer. They made a decision in the summer. I disagreed with that. I don't... Like, I never, ever 
want to say people should lose their job, but I don't think we saw enough. And there had been so much change at the club to not change the head coach. For me, it felt like like a, an oversight to be polite. So, yeah, the, you can talk about all that, but more it's what's going on in the past. They, Imagine, they I just watched this game and thought, man, you look like a relic. The whole club just looks like something from a, an era in the past. You watched Spurs. And like I looked at the, the, today, every game you watch Spurs, there are things, there are flaws that Spurs have. We know that we know about them. Set pieces, sometimes sometimes they're defending their high line, but you know what they're about. And you, I looked at their their stats today, and they're they're like they have more shots on target per game than any, than any other team in the league. Create more big chances, joint highest touches in the box, more corners, more crosses, more win more possession in the final third. Like all these underlying things, I know they're like. They're not, they're not meaningful on their own but they show you that whatever's happened whether they're on the wrong side of a result or not they have an idea Manchester United haven't had an idea for a decade yeah well I mean there was a few other stats that I wanted to bring in because they slightly uh, contradicted my intro where I was like oh, there's nothing new to say about Manchester United but I then went and looked at some st- stats that Opta put together after this game uh, and one thing we can be sure it's time to retire the lads it's Tottenham when it comes to Manchester United another Sir Alex Ferguson legacy that they've ruined because Tottenham are now unbeaten in each of their last four Premier League games against Manchester United, their longest run without a defeat against them in the competition since 2012-2014. Manchester United's seven points are their joint fewest after six games of a Premier League season. Meanwhile, only in 2007-8, when they had four, have they scored fewer goals from their first six Premier League games. And United have lost consecutive Premier League matches without scoring at Old Trafford for the first time since November 2021 in what were Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's final two games, home games in charge, but they happen to be against Liverpool and Manchester City. So, Alisson, is it only a matter of time before we say farewell to Eric Ten Hag? The club saying he's not going to be sacked, he's saying he's not going to be sacked. Well, he's not going to be sacked before the international break. I think we can infer that from what's been said. I don't think there's been any, we're going to stick with him for the next six years, come what may about it. No. I... It's this was supposed to be. I I, I I can see it in Gregor's face. He's fr- he's frustrated at this. What what he's seen, and I I get it because this is supposed. This was supposed to be a sexy fixture. <laughs> this is this. Man United Spurs is supposed to be sexy, isn't it? It's yeah. supposed to be. There's been there've been matches, lots of goals, in the Premier League era. There's something about the aura of both clubs. Um, maybe a slightly faded aura in in some respects, but. They're trying to find something that matches their passionate fan bases and their history. And when they meet, it's sort of like an advert for the Premier League in a way, and the Premier League's history and English football's history. Yeah, There's well, something this was, about it. This was Martin Samuel's point on Thursday that it was the big, the big Sunday game, Manchester yeah, United against Tottenham. There's, there's for the... something glittering about yeah. it, and therefore one of the easiest to do a, a, a team talk for, pep talk for, because. You're at home. Spurs have enough aggression about them to feel like you can really get them on the counter, really punish them, you know, with a bit of organisation and solidity and um, faith in yourselves. This should have been a high-scoring game in which the home team wins. That's what it should. That's, that's what it should have been. And yet. They did the weirdest part. I know you're asking me about Ten Hag's future. This, no, no, this is a long, as... long, long, long-winded way of answering it. Is if he can't get the team up and ready and organised for the visit of a highly aggressive Spurs team, I don't, I don't know why he's there. Yeah, I don't know what the point of him is. I guess just finally, Manchester United fans are probably desperate for me to just check Bruno Fernandez red card. He said it was a yellow after the game. The United captain red card, Gregor. It's one of those ones now where the, whatever the referee decides on the pitch, it's not going to be overturned because no. you can look at the freeze frames. But there was no, there was no like, actually not really any aggression in it. He was trying to hook him to to bring him down, maybe take maybe take a book in foul. He wasn't trying to kick him in the knee, and he did kick him in the knee, so it gave the referee an option. I don't know if that's an answer, Tom. It's not. It's not. It's not. An answer. <laughs> it never is. It never is with I you. I don't but, think. You know. yeah. It could be either way. It was knee high. Uh, funnily enough, yes, I, I, Greg has had bad no le- force either. No, Greg has had bad leg breaks, but uh, I've had a few injuries. And yesterday, just funnily enough, after watching the United match, I went out for a walk, 
and er, seriously that's and, hilarious <laughs> and my knee started hurting in the way that it does when you've had serious knee like I- issues and that's less hilarious sorry. So, yeah, yeah. you two, went too early on that gag two minutes, <laughs> two minutes into the walk I sort of stopped and went I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to Waitrose uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and I was and I, honestly you I was tell struggling tell us a times podcast can't you but, <laughs> But um, that was because of a, a silly tackle knee high that uh, some idiots made uh, a number of years ago. And if you do that sort of stuff, you can expect a red card. I feel like you're getting your vengeances out on this you, podcast. Yeah. Another thing as well. Fans who had a go another thing Twitter. that I, I'm very annoyed about. I was going to watch the new Saoirse Ronan film uh, yesterday, and then I realised that I was on the <laughs> podcast off, and I had to watch this match, and I, I feel worse off for it. I, I would have enjoyed the film. Got two stars uh, and, in the Times. And, and uh, I, I would like to make my own opinion of that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Bruno Fernandez, this, red or yellow? This, red or yellow? Uh, it was red. It was let's, red let's, let's be clear that yeah. that tackle would never result in your knee injury. It was never going to do that. So, but you say red. So well, yes, it could be a red. It was never going to indeed. You can't go in knee high. high. I trust the referee. He, he was to right on it. top of it, and I think he can judge the pace of it and, and the intent of it and the severity of it. I think it's one of those. We're always flipping things over and saying how things look worse in slow mo. I think it looked <laughs> better in slow mo. I kind of agree, actually. At the time, I thought, oh, and then you watched it back and you went, hmm, it's not that bad. Okay. I, it sounds like we're not really, kind of, it's not really an excuse. I, I wanted to finish on Tottenham. Kind of look, Gregor, like they, uh, you, you've already highlighted some of the good things that they're doing. Yeah. Dominic with Solanke scoring goals that poacher strikers should be scoring. Brennan Johnson looking impressive again. Starting to look yeah, like just... it's coming together for Ange. Yeah, just every game as well. Every game you watch, whether you watch it live or you watch the highlights or whatever, they just create so many chances. Again, they've got the highest XG in the league as, as well. I think two teams have outscored them, but they're, they're creating better chances than anyone else in the league. And, yeah, I mean, I think kulosevsky has been a revelation so far this season, moved, moving inside the way he can kind of carry the ball forward, but also, like, He's always a classy, classy kind of winger who, who come inside and look for little through balls. He's got more opportunity to do that. I think he created nine chances in this game. He's he's been brilliant. Kind of, although I, looked, I remember looking at the start of the season. My goodness, look at that midfield three. You've got basically two number tens in Kulusevski and Madison, and not even a number six, probably a number eight in Benton Coor, and that's your midfield three. But you know, this is this is the way that Angie's approaching it, and. You know, they're creating a lot of chances and so much pace and dynamism. And Timo Werner could have had a couple. Like they, they should have had a couple. Yeah, <laughs> they look good. They look good. I mean, there will be games where they'll be punished for their approach, and there will be games where they'll outscore teams. It's just where that's going to take them. It's quite funny that they had three three defensive players on the team, and the which were much more defensively solid than Manchester United. <laughs> yes. That's the final put down for Manchester United, even though we managed to. Uh, it should have been five. It should have been five. That, there's your final put down. Maybe six. Maybe six. <laughs> maybe six. Maybe, maybe seven. Six. More problems for Eric Ten Hag to come, uh, I'm sure. Anyway, we must move on. And Gregor, if you thought that was a challenge talking about Manchester United and Eric Ten Hag, you might find this next section even more painful. Chelsea, chaotic, terrible ownership, madness. Why have they signed all these players? Oh, damn. They might actually be quite good. Was that Are you ready to get off? <laughs> you ready to get off the grumpy old man chair and admit that you might, you might be slightly wrong about? God that. no, Palmer's good. <laughs> Go, Palmer is really good. They're not look quite good as a team, yeah, as a collective did. Did, now. All did, of a sudden, they did. But I've been Brighton also, you know, bit of a calamitous high line a lot of the yes. time. Uh, no, look, there is the, there is the kind of. The makings of a team starting to emerge. You can you can pick the team, which is a rarity as well. You can say this is this is likely to be Chelsea. That I'll give you that. Up. That is an admission of a change in opinion because that was one of your big points last season. Is that you'd like? I don't know where this all works. Now you're saying it looks like it works as a starting eleven. Yeah, and look, there's still a, there's still other plenty of other options, but it looks like he's he's kind of alighted on a on a eleven that he he sees as the best just now. And but but this is all about Goldbammer. I mean. He's he's had more goal involvements than any other player in the big five leagues in Europe since the start of last season. So what is it? Forty three. Forty three goal <laughs> involvements. That's one more than Erling Haaland. We're talking about I don't know what we're talking about. Someone who's just exploded in the space of a year and is like one of the best players in Europe. Oh, immediately. And it's it's remarkable. I can't really remember anyone doing that before. Not in that short space as 
short mm. that short a period of time, not kind of t- getting a move and there's still been so much unknown about him. Yeah, he was someone with potential and, you know, he had he had fleeting sort of glimpses of how good he was at or could be at Man City, but they were very fleeting. And in the space of just over a year, he's suddenly one of the best players in Europe. That's unprecedented, I think. So, you know, while he's playing well, he's in their team, they'll always have a chance now. <laughs> they will always have a chance. But um I'm still not quite ready to, to say that. Chelsea we need we need to see what Chelsea yet. do against teams exactly, that do yeah. not play into their hands, and it is slightly bizarre. I mean, I know I know that Brighton want to play the way they want to play, but Wolves, it's almost a carbon copy of the Wolves game in that it was competitive for a bit, but Wolves showed you don't you don't allow what Chelsea have is pace. Actually, they have a lot of pace, and if you have a high line, they'll get in behind you. Uh, it was just ask. They were asking for trouble, Brighton. So it'd be interesting when the team is set up more in a grown-up fashion and less reckless fashion to see how they do. Also, let's remind ourselves that Brighton had, I think, Brighton took the lead as well and had a lot of chances in that first yeah. half. You watched like watching the extended highlights package of this. You, you watched. You kind of it'd gone on for a long time and you weren't even at half time and a lot of the chances were Brighton. So. They are not, they, you know, they're not the real, they're not the finished article by any means. It is still quite chaotic, but they've got a app. lot of goal threats, like uh, from lots of areas as well. So where where do we think this puts <clears> them, Hamza, in terms of, as I said at the top, Gregor and lots of people. Let's be fair to Gregor; it wasn't just Gregor who was critical of them last season, and rightly so. Where do you think it puts them in terms of where we're looking at in terms of getting carried away after only six games and making big assessments? Title contenders, top four, top six. Where do we reckon with this Chelsea team? Uh, fourth. Four. Yeah, great. That was the quickest answer that anyone's <laughs> ever given to it, that kind of big question. But you think so? For you think that you could see them challenging for the top four with where they're at? Uh, yeah, um, th- there is a feeling that uh, at Chelsea that despite all the criticism from external criticism, that um, this was sort of actually well, not sort of. It was by design. They recruited to Marenza's uh, Maresca, sorry's specifications yeah. during the summer. And they'd already established um, a good sort of core group of players that needed to be whittled down. Um, I mean, some of the stats from Palmer is amazing. I mentioned Masroi and sorry, uh, I mentioned um, uh, Xerxes and Hoyland don't take many shots. And yeah. you've got Palmer taking seven here. It's amazing. You see those numbers and instantly you're like seven shots. Wow. Well, <laughs> well, you should be if you're statistically tuned in. But um, <laughs> but no, um, uh, the, the issue for them, just like Liverpool, is well. Um, we still play Manchester City, uh, and we haven't had a super sort of um, test of them since. And the same is true Liverpool haven't played anyone good yet. Uh, however, those teams play each other in a fortnight, I think. Yes, uh, so of October. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a good measure of them then. Uh, but I think uh, Alisson's right as well uh, in that. Well, perhaps teams approach Chelsea thinking they are going to get the Chelsea of last season or the season before. Uh, and at some point this season, if Chelsea keep playing this way, opponents will go, actually, we should treat them like a top proper team. Yeah. And we're going to sit back and defend. And then that poses a different set of questions because then you can't use that pace of, of Jackson and Madweke as much. Uh, but uh, probably I think we should just give a little word in for, for Sancho as well. Mm-hmm. When I watched yeah. him uh, live last week, week before, against West Ham, uh, he didn't get to do that much but in the moments that he did have the ball he was really good fun to watch he got you out your seat there's a lovely trick that he did where he moved the ball from left to right to left all within the space of a second and it had um, Edson Alvarez literally sort of go full 360 and then like dive on the floor none of which got him any closer (laughs) to the ball Uh, it was um, that was a great move yeah it was was brilliant it was really cool and that's the sort of stuff that I think uh, people will remember when they first heard of Jadon Sancho Uh, so I, I think it's really nice to see him playing well and got an uh, got a assist yeah, he as looks well. He confident as well, doesn't he? That give and go, just I'm going to dart straight into the box and win that penalty. I mean, he, he looked excellent. Maybe start getting back into contention for England. But on that soft subject, I wanted to finish, uh, Alison, because that's a, kind of the subject of Tom Allnut's piece about uh, Cole Palmer, saying that um, Lee Carsley, if he was making any kind of notes, he'd just be like, <laughs> Cole Palmer, underline, in the team. <laughs> but it's an issue, isn't it? We were talking um, with the last uh, international break about Carsley start and Grealish coming back in and Anthony Gordon looks good and I think it was Tom Allnut himself on this show who said yeah I saw well and good but what happens when Cole Palmer and Phil Foden are around yeah. is 
Cole Palmer now, of all the kind of wonderful collection of attacking players, is he top of the tree for you at the minute? Well, he was before. I mean, I was saying it through through the last tournament that Palmer's an ideal England candidate because he doesn't let anything stop him being good. So he, he was functioning beautifully in a dysfunctional Chelsea team last season mm. and was one reason why they scraped their way into European competition. He's He's... He's serene and one assumes, and he did, when he did play for England fleetingly, he did he did do well, didn't he? You know, he, he, he can slot in anyway. He's so calm. He's so calm, Palm. He's a calm, Palm. He's so <laughs> calm. He's, he's impressive. And I think Tom Allnett makes the point as well. It's all very well having favourites or whatever, but his stats, as Gregor has pointed out, mean... Every other nation in the world will laugh at us if we don't build a team around him. Yes, true. Because he's fantastic. Yes, absolutely true. Carsey does love him as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember in the under-21 European Championship, he didn't just play him out wide. He, well, he, he, he played him out wide first, sort of... in On the in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then he sort of said, uh, can, you, uh, can you play centre mid? And he did. And it was bizarre because you've got this very slim, tall guy in midfield next to him. <laughs> A very short Angel Gomez. <laughs> Angel Gomez. <laughs> and they ran the show, uh, and he was capable of playing as a centre midfielder. Uh, it really, really cool. And Carsley has always spoken quite hi- highly of Palmer. So I think um, if he is going to, I think he will probably get picked uh, and start a one match with, with two, maybe. Uh, and it will be in a way that sort of celebrates his, mm. his best qualities. Very yeah, just don't try and fit them all into the team. No, no, get them all in. Just don't try and do that. Great, save it. We've got another international break to come <coughs> and we can discuss all of that and you can okay. roll your eyes at the England problems again. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm already excited. But for now, we've got more to come. We will be talking about Liverpool after the break. But as it's the break, it means it's quiz time. Who am I talking about when I say a former footballer who played in the Premier League for Portsmouth, Middlesbrough, Everton and Blackburn and twice, like Cole Palmer, scored four goals in a game in both 2004 and 2011. Find out after the break. Hello and welcome back to the Game Football Podcast from The Times. I'm Tom Clark and I've got Alison Rudd, Hamza Khalik Luna and Gregor Robertson with me. Before the break, I asked a quiz question that Hamza was so keen to answer, arguably too keen. We need to set the parameters for how this works. I say find out after the break. We pause, we have a little chat. We top up our drinks and then we come back and we say that the answer is... Yakubu. Yakubu. Oh, sorry, I, I pressed the button afterwards. <laughs> I was that keen, you yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, Yakubu. I've got his match attacks good. card where he scored four goals. Did you guys get that as well, as well as Hamza? Not that you had a chance. I, did, I don't think my brain card. had connected by the time I spoke. Yeah, anyway, oh, yeah. Yakubu is the answer. Anyway, let's move on. Should we get this out of the way, everyone? Alison, you were at <laughs> Liverpool. <laughs> They're currently top of the table. I said I'm a bit hungover, so you know I'm just going to throw to you and let you talk for ten minutes, and I'll come back. No, no, back can we set a timer? Yes. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Go on, let's start. Alison, okay. you were at Liverpool. They're currently top of the table. Take it away. Uh, well, <laughs> it's it's tough. I just have to. Say. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> it's not easy. It's an odd way to get to the top of the table. You should, You're read, still you should, read, out, you should read out your intro because it was very, very good. Should I, do you want to read it out or shall I read it? Uh, it's odd reading yourself. Yeah, I'll read it out. I'll read it's, it out. Not, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not the intro. It's the third power in, I think you mean. Oh, my God. I've got to do three whole paragraphs. No, right. no don't, do the, don't do the first two. Which one do you want me to do? The third one. This is the first time I have watched Arna Slot's team in the flesh and it was quite the experience. It was like your best friend had dated a rock star and every night out had been wild and fun, only for the hot couple to decide they needed a break. Suddenly she walks into the restaurant with a corporate lawyer on her arm who is clever and witty but never dances on the table and frequently (laughs) checks his phone for case updates. (laughs) That's what it was like. That is football reporting of the highest level. That is what you get from Times journalists. So, But what you're saying, Alison... Mm is like you were saying a few weeks ago on the podcast, is that you're still not over Jurgen Klopp. And even though poor old Arna's walked in and taken your team to the top of the table, you're still not happy. Yeah, and I'm kind of amazed at the fans that are flying flags with Slot's face on. I mean, you have to go through a process. He genuinely means it. I you have try. to go through a process. Otherwise, what's the meaning of loyalty and love in football? I am still adjusting to a post-Klopp Grieving. era. Grieving, possibly. And it and and yeah, of course, it's it's lovely to to win a game when you're not playing brilliantly, and you do it through grown up patience. 
which That's Jürgen could huge... have done with doing a bit more and then of he might course. have won more trophies, you know what I'm of saying? Of course, <laughs> of course. But it was a long, the Klopp era was long and it was beautiful largely and it was certainly fun. And I don't, th- I don't think it's stupid of me to find it difficult to, to readjust to this. It's, it was like watching another team all together and yet str- because all the players are the same, that messes with your head quite a lot. So uh, maybe that, that it would have been I, maybe it would have been easier if there'd been a clear out and Slot had brought in. She quite wants a, few... a clear out now. Get rid of Salah. <laughs> no, no, I mean I'm just saying in terms of, in terms of adjustment, it'd been easier if if there were more new faces on the pitch and then you, you, your brain would have acknowledged that and then uh, accepted the change in style. But you've got the same players, but they're playing in a very and. I know that, that this, is, this is the funny part because they're playing in a good way. They're mature and they're patient. And th- there was a strange atmosphere because Wolves were the better team in the opening 20 minutes. And that was a slight shock because in the programme notes, Gary O'Neill had said we need to scrap and battle. And it, it felt like the sort of rallying cry you get when you've got five games to go in your bottom and you need to get out of the relegation zone. But they didn't scrap and battle. They actually played quite composed front foot football and were making inroads but the crowd the home crowd weren't excited by this because they could see what was happening they could see that Liverpool were just biding their time biding their time not get not just not not diving in just making sure they ushered ushered the ball away gradually until they saw a space to attack into and when they did they looked they looked dangerous. So it's not just. So just, it's it's nothing. There's nothing wrong with yeah. slot. It's not nothing that you wrong don't with Liverpool. Admire him. It's, it's just, about. It is just, all about what came before. This isn't my team. This isn't my team yet. It's not what came. It's about what came before. It's not it's that you have a problem different. with what he what he's different. doing. It's just you're still not over it. Well, I've got some good news for you, Alison. Anyway, <laughs> Liverpool have led the Premier League after six matches four times in the past seven seasons and only won the league once. So it's fine. At the end of well, the season, you'll finish third, and you'll be like, bring back Jurgen. Well, and this is this is the other thing. Who'd also Slot, finished third, Slot, by the way. Slot was the first to say it's meaningless being top at the end of October. He is remarkably no, measured, September. isn't he? Mm. Like that's also jarring too when when you com- just com- how contrast it contrast it, is, it to what yeah. came before. You it's know, great, somebody tries to crack it? a I joke mean, with him and like he's not you know, going in front of. He's the... a nice guy and he's got he's personable yeah, and he exactly. smiles and he he laughs about. And he's not you know he's nearly just, assaulting just... fourth officials on the touchline like Jurgen Klopp did <laughs> or you know embarrassing himself by doing the big arms up in the air celebration after a two-two draw against Norwich or whoever it was. Look, having said, Come on, having said West all this, Brom. West like, Brom. I having was said close. all Come this, having said all this, they've. He's done an unbelievable job. He's mate. He's great. He Team has, Arne. He has. Look I mean, at he... Eric Ten Hag. We all said, you know, Dutch managers can't do it. They don't know what they're talking Tom's about. Tom's still drunk. Oh, Tom's still drunk. Ten Come Hag. on. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's half the reason why you have to be patient uh, and you have to see what Slot's got because, oh, he's beaten United. They're so bad. Don't break, <laughs> they're we've so done bad. Much, no, we've done we, too we much. We've covered United. them at the start of the season. We said, yeah, they conceded like the second most shots in the league last season. They're, they're rubbish. And Liverpool haven't played anyone good yet. They might play someone good in two weeks when you they play Chelsea. Only beat what's in front of you. And also. when they play Arsenal, we'll see if they're the real deal. But Alisson is completely right. You can't sort of sing songs and wave flags for a guy that's. But he's coming. I mean, after this is this, extraordinary analysis for this, a team that's just gone top of the league. After this reign of so long, easy, the flip side easy is, teams. as much as it makes it hard for you to say, "Oh, I can't get on board as a fan." This is a guy who's come in after you. This could have been the worst hangover ever. Worse than the one I'm having now <laughs> that Arna Slot walked into. Taking over from Klopp, it's going to be as hard as whoever takes over from Pep. And he's just walked in with the same squad, the same players. Nah, you're all right. I don't need to put my stamp on this squad. No problem. He comes in. He beats Man United. He then does a post-match team talk afterwards where he just explains to Roy Keane, who's looking at him going, this guy knows what he's talking about. Explains how he picked them apart. Just walking around, waving, yeah, top of the league. That's brilliant. And I'm yeah, not that slagging him off. Football. I'm just saying it's hard to adjust. Uh, they're, super, they're, they're lucky too. Oh in all seriousness, they've had very easy fixtures. And here's, here's a, a, a real serious point. They've had three soft tissue injuries, causing four games missed after seven weeks. That's unbelievable. Like Klopp never had that privilege oh of being able to, to choose an unchanged team for right. how many this weeks. This is wild. Run. This is absolutely Elliot's been in, look, look, compare them to every other team in the league, and every other team in the league has a number of injuries, right? Everyone. And Liverpool have their second choice attacking midfielder, Harvey Elliott, out. Alisson, the goalkeeper, had a bit of a knock. And that's pretty much about it. They've been very fortunate with injuries so far. 
unbelievable. Uh, we'll we'll right, see I'm how gonna... they cope with him later on in the season. But the, the, things have fallen very, very nicely for Slot so far. And he's done a good of, and he's made the most of that, apart from the Forest match. Honestly, if um, the Liverpool ticket office is listening to this, don't let them get a ticket. If next time they want to come, not in the press box, just don't let them come. This is embarrassing. Genuinely a disgrace. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't uh, be a disgrace for me to, me to go rah, rah, rah. I don't care about what happened in mm. my previous seven years. I only care what happened He's in gone. the last ten it's minutes. Over. That's what Manchester United fans would do. They'd be like, oh, yeah, got a new guy. Yeah, looks good, whatever. No, we're looking at the actual process. No, here, that's what the they've structures. done as well. That's no. what they're still harking back to the good old, let it go. Anyway, right, I'm going to move on and ask Alison a quick question about Wolves. Because you'd said when we talked about them uh, in relation to them being at the bottom and in the bottom three, I just want to quickly ask, having seen them again, your kind of assessment was that Wolves are playing quite well. Oh, I'm a bit shocked that they're anywhere near the bottom. Oh, Wolves. Yeah. Are, are, you st- are you still like that? Or now are you feeling like, well, actually, having seen them, I, I can see a few issues that um, Gary O'Neill's going to have. They're, well, they're not They're not going to rise above mid-table. But, but you don't but see I, relegation. They're, not, they're no. not, they are not bottom three material. They're really not. No. Okay. And what about? Uh, I want to move on to another team who I was talking about in that bottom three. Everton picking up a very important win this weekend uh, against Crystal Palace. Paul Joyce writing in the Times about the return of Jared Branthwaite at the back. And Alison, that this is a big this is a big deal for Everton, isn't it? Getting this win. Other games at home where they've been in the lead, uh, but that famous Bournemouth game, of course, important for Sean Dyche to just get a very Sean Dyche type win, two one. Yeah. No. But but the. the, the... Paul Joyce focuses entirely on Branthwaite and how important he is that he's back. And yes, Branthwaite is, I would say, a very fine defender. What matters more is that it lifts. It's his return has lifted the club. So he, he could actually be a deeply average defender, and it would still be a huge lift if he could focus on having some good news at last. He has um, the potential to be a defender with some aura, and if you if you if the team are lifted by his presence and the sense that they can get back to defending as well as they they have done under Dyche, actually. He's, he's, when Branthwaite's been there, they've looked good. So it's more about the, the use of him being back in terms of morale boosting and <coughs> making them feel as... So it's, it's one positive thing that's happened. So I think Joyce is right built to focus on him. He's not the world's greatest defender, but it means so much to Everton to have something good to talk about. I still can't get my head around what we've just all spoken about. Well, you're going to have to they get your head. two goals in six games. Oh, don't bring it well. back. I, I, I'm they've moving re-ima- on. I've, I've got no time for it. I've they've no like reimagined the midfield and like reimagined in particular Graven Birch, who's like oh, he's been a revelation. Do, yeah, and having not got the player they wanted to sign in the summer as well. Indeed, yeah. Everyone was crying out for a yeah, new manager who can cope without getting any signings but you know I, I totally appreciate the kind of the the human sort of contrast but with what we're actually seeing on the pitch no I think I mean I, I said at the start of the season they might finish fifth so you I meant it because they like it's extra it's, this is one of the hardest things like you, every time we've seen someone with that deeply entrenched that kind of standing and like legendary status at a club move on what's come next has been like Tumultuous and painful, and it still could be. It's what, but I, what I said. Five it's been an extraordinary been. start. <laughs> so I asked the same question to you that I asked to the other guys about Chelsea. You said fifth for Liverpool at the start of the season. You're looking at them going, hey, why can't they win the title? I don't. I, I still wouldn't personally say that they'll win the title, but they, I'm not asking you they, to say they will win the title. But you know, this is a you know more open field now. We're going to come and finish and talking about Rodri, no Manchester City. It could you be know, more dropping open points. Field, yeah. But you're I would looking still at Liverpool, look... thinking they could be in this now. I'm, I can't ask the same question to these two jokers. They're going to say they're going to finish twelfth. So I think they could. I think they could be in it for for the for the long haul. But I still don't think they'll win it. Okay, fine. I teed you up there. You wanted to talk excitedly about Liverpool, and then you you know went and sat on your fence. I don't think they're. I don't. I don't know, Tom. It's hard to predict. I think they're, they're a lot better than I thought they were going to be. You, you can't tell much about them until they play three games a week and play some good teams, right? We'll see. Yeah, it's the common sense yeah. answer. We'll <clears throat> common Sorry. sense, Sorry. Alison Rudd. When have you ever gone with common <laughs> sense? Anyway, talk, let's talk about another team who are definitely hoping to be in title contention. Arsenal, back to winning ways with a big, important comeback win. Gregor, you were there. I wasn't going to ask you if they win the title because you're not going to tell me. But your impressions of this performance and this game? There's a lot to say about this game. The, the, at half time, I was thinking about like you, watching the game. I think they had Arsenal had seventy five percent of the ball, and it was literally like watching the week before when Arsenal 
when City played against Arsenal and the the opposition were encamped like inside their own box, except it was a living aside. And I was just thinking, what you know, what is the point in this? It was <laughs> it was they were utterly abject Leicester in the first half. Uh, it was honestly, it was ridiculous. And I look, actually looked at the game. I was looking at half time. In the last eight seasons, you always think that you need a magic forty points to stay up. The last eight seasons, it's been thirty five or, or less. So like, the gulf between the top and bottom of the league has never been as big. And I thought, well, wow. and then they came out and James Justin <laughs> scored a brace. The second was an absolute yeah. beauty as well. And then I started thinking about James Justin as well. I honestly think there's an alternative universe where James Justin could be an England regular, could be playing for someone like Liverpool now. But, you know, he got his England debut. He played for Leicester. When he signed for Leicester, they were competing to get in the Champions League. He was their best player and got his England debut. You know, season ending injury. He was out for like a year, came back and he was in a team in the Championship. And now he's 26. And I'm not sure that's going to happen. I just sort of, that was another thing I thought. Anyway, a lot to say about this game. Then You're not after, wrong. There's a lot to say after about that. Game. After that, it just you know, Leicester had that period at the start of the second half, and Arsenal again. It just went back to, you know, them throwing everything at them, corner after corner. Uh, couldn't find a way through. The goalkeeper had an absolutely extraordinary afternoon, uh, Hermanson, and and then a young seventeen-year-old came on. I think stole the show, and he came on the eighty-fifth minute. And his impact was... Hang on. Was it was 2-2. Two, two, all that happened. And Ethan Wanieri came on in the 85th minute and stole the show. I think so. That is quite a statement. You can't tell just me Liverpool are going to win the league, but you are going to go for something as bold as that. I love it. <laughs> go for just it. Tell me more. Just because for all Arsenal's dominance, I don't think anyone really stood out that much. Martinelli was better than he has been. He still doesn't look like he's full of confidence. He got his goal. Trossard obviously got a goal. Trossard was the man ultimately who popped up at the back stick, but it was an own goal. Uh, so I, I, the, the thing, the thing that Arsenal fans will go home talking about was was Ethan Ranieri's performance because he came on, he immediately got the got the ball from Julian Timber, just charged inside and let let fly from twenty five yards and uh, another great save to push that wide. Then he got the ball again. Uh, and he could have just laid it inside to Saka. He could have let Saka do the, you know, he's the talisman. You you try and make something happen. No, he drove in at the box again. And he, he, there was a brilliant passage of play where he was like running at Christensen, the left back. A little feints left and right, you know, so fleet footed. And then he, he did this kind of, he cut back on himself and did almost like a full 360 turn and to manage to come inside him. And you're just, your eyes widened then. At this stage, I mean, I've seen like seen him on TV. I watched the bit of the Bolton the, the Bolton game in midweek when he scored two goals. That was his first start. Obviously, I saw he he, he made his debut at 15, which was like two years ago now, and has had very few minutes between uh, in the in the time that's followed. This was he arrived this week. This week he arrived as a first team player for Arsenal, and I think Arteta kind of admitted as much after the Bolton game. Odegaard's injury has kind of opened the door. And now I think the fans want also want to see him, and also the fact that they put him on in a game in a moment of such consequence when they were looking for they'd already put on Sterling, they'd already put on I think Jesus maybe came on around the same time. They don't have many other options either. Mm. They're quite light on the bench. They've got four academy kids on the bench. He came on and he made things happen. So you talk about Odegaard, but he, <clears> he's not that type of player, is he? Is he more advanced than that? Is he more? Do you see him playing out mm. wide, running at defenders? You were talking. He about? can. He's played, but he played. Plays most of his football. I was looking. He played most of his football for the twenty ones as like a number eight, right. either left or right side number eight. But when you're playing for a team like Arsenal, that ultimately is like in a lot of games, like playing as a number ten. It's like playing as one of the a front five or six even. So he can play there. He's played wide. He's played as a number ten. He's even played up front for some during some stages of his development. But I think just those, he's a player who like he's best at his best in those little pockets of space. But he's also quick. Mm. Like the people have drawn parallels with, in fact, Arteta has drawn parallels with Jack Wilshire. He's left footed, he's great in tight spaces. He's not like a, the kind of midfielder that England traditionally produce many of, but he's also really quick. So, yeah, exciting, really exciting. Alison, how important is it for Arsenal after the big game against Manchester City and a tough run of fixtures, as Tom Allnut was talking about? Home game, Leicester, parking the bus, 2 0 up, concede two find a way to win this is another big statement isn't it in terms of the character of this team 
Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. I mean, Leicester were abysmal, though, and it's kind of weird that they got back. So you'd to be two, more two. worried about the two-two part of this no, game. I, it I was misleading. So. The scoreline was misleading at that stage. Like, but they've had this. But Arsenal have been through this before. You look at the stats afterwards, and you say, "Oh, they had 32, 32 shots, and they've come away with a draw." This is not. This is an old problem for Arsenal over the past. I say old problem, a ten-year-old po- problem, <laughs> that they've. I've frequently been to Arsenal games where they've dropped points, but they were by far the better team. So maybe the fact that they have someone like when. Wanieri on the bench that they can bring on where they didn't have him before this speaks volumes about their production line and so on and, and who they have and Arteta it, if he's got one distinctive attribute as a manager is that he does he does he does seem to have the ability to take risks late on in games and he does he does trust his bench actually more than a lot of managers do he's he likes nurturing and bringing people through so yeah, so yeah, there's a worry that they they had so many shots and were struggling till ninety plus what ninety plus seven ninety plus eight ninety fourth they scored the first and then they scored again. Well, that's leaving it blooming late, <coughs> isn't it? Indeed. So I mean, you, uh, you can you can interpret it both ways, but to me this is this is this has been a problem Arsenal have had, and yeah, there is the irony way. that they did it they did it to City yeah. themselves. If only they had a manager who could you know just get the job done early and get the points wrapped up <laughs> even in the smaller <laughs> games. <coughs> Honest oh, lot. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Gregor, we talked just briefly there about Wolves and Everton teams at the bottom. For Leicester, then, am I suggesting that there's a bit of a worry for you? Obviously, against Arsenal at home, you kind of, you know, what are you expecting other than parking the bus? But what did you make of them from what you saw? Well, the first half, like I say, the Arsenal literally let William Saliba mark Jamie Vardy on the halfway line on his own. And then every other player, like uh, Gabriel. Even as a centre half, was like was was like last week watching, you know, Gavardiol and Kanji and Ruben Diaz around the edge of the box. Like they were so advanced, and Leicester just had nothing, nothing going forward. They did come out with a bit more kind of gumption in the second half. They got the goal, which was a bit fortunate, and then the second goal was a, was an absolute beauty. And they started to, in the kind of transitions, keep the ball a little bit better. But I, I don't know. I just don't see. That they're going to score many goals. I think the reliance on Vardy, and even Cooper said afterwards, like it was, it looked like Vardy was kind of remonstrating with the bench, saying, "I don't want to come off." And he was like, oh, he was asked that question, and he said, "Listen, if Vardy, Vardy's not going to come off much. <laughs> they don't have many options. They don't have many attacking options." So, yeah, this is a kind of these are this game, Liverpool, City. They're kind of one-offs, but I, I fear for them. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Ipswich have kind of gone on a really positive run of the last couple of games, but last four games. But I think I think again it's going to be very difficult for the three promoted teams. We will see what the future holds for Leicester. Uh, Gregor, you we're talking about pieces that you've written from games uh, on Saturday and over the weekend. Let's talk about a piece that you wrote just before the weekend, which is previewed on this show, wasn't it? Last week when you started talking about teams scoring from well, it was a throwaway from... comment about the ball going back to the goalkeeper all yeah. the time. And, and uh, then, and obviously, of course, Brentford had scored two goals. Twelve hundred words later, we've got a fascinating. <laughs> Maybe fourteen, about. actually. <laughs> 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 too many, it, always too it many. It always is. We ask him for twelve, <laughs> he delivers fifteen. But yes, the, they were at it again, at Brentford. Tell yeah. us about what you found when you uh, did a bit of a deep dive into how teams are taking the kickoff this season. Yeah. Stick with me, listener. The, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, so I watched all the Hamza helped me as well because it's not easy to, get to find all the kickoffs. But we watched all the kickoffs from the previous weekend. And 15 of the 20 Premier League sides played one pass and then launched it. And that just feels like deeply out of sync with the the trends of modern football and the way that, you know, possession, dominance, you know, take attack, press bait and defenders, all that kind of stuff. So that's I thought that was quite unusual in itself. And also, 11 of those 15 went straight back to the keeper, which certainly in my day, and even I would say a decade ago, would have like just never ever happened. It would almost get a boo from your own crowd. You'd be like, "What? Well, you know, that's cowardly." <laughs> and now that's the way that that's the way teams start a game. And it's what, not what bit... did you find that they were doing it for then? Yeah. Where did so the la- not... where did the launch go? So it's it's about setting up. It's f- several reasons. One is teams are so good at pressing now that you're almost setting yourself up to fail if you give it back to a defender and someone's on top of them very quickly. So they go further back to the goalkeeper. 
as we saw in the Man City Arsenal game last week, the defenders often block the runs of the attacker to give the keeper even more time to get the ball forward. So that's one reason. And the next is you're setting up a positive kind of 50-50 duel. And what Brentford did so well in the in the in the in the last two weeks is they got they they hit Chris, Christopher Ayer, who's six foot six, I think, and got seven players in a about 20, 20, 25 yard square area of the pitch to win the second ball. And he didn't even necess- it didn't necessarily fall to them. That's almost secondary. In both games, Gundogan for City, um, and who else was it? I think it was Kulisevsky against Spurs. You could argue they made a mistake, but and they kind of give you know gave Brentford a chance. But Brentford were there they t- to capitalise on it. They won the ball back, turned it over, and the clear instructions just go forward. There were chances to play it sideways, to play it backwards. No, one time Norgard played a risky pass forward to Mbemo. He played it wide, and everyone gets in the box. So it's like just the clear instruction to make a beeline for the for the goal in, the, in those opening stages, and you think it'll catch the opposition cold. And Brentford, they did it again. You know, there was there was more elapsed. There was kind of turnovers, but in that opening minute, until the ball goes kind of really goes dead, Brentford are just banging it forward, and not like aimlessly. They're 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 setting up kind of favourable duels. And getting making sure they're getting people in the box and crosses in the box, and they I think they got two maybe three crosses in the box before Mbemo scored this time, but still thirty eight seconds after twenty two and twenty three, it's extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary. Hamza, do you think this could be a trend that is going to grow? Greg has kind of alighted on a, a an early trend. Do you think you see other teams adopting this kind of tactic? I, I think you, there's a few goals that might stick out that that listeners might remember uh, the FA Cup final Manchester City against Manchester United where City Is scored the Gundogan that's Wonder right Strike, exactly yeah. that one but again the ball goes back long to Ed- goes Edison Edison goes long and I think again it's a, a second ball playing off Haaland but it's the same principle you, you go long you isolate a one on one and play for the second ball and there's a very different kickoff routine from Bournemouth against Arsenal not was it the season before last um where Gary O'Neill's Bournemouth kick off and they overload one side, then they play to the other to sort of punk them, and then they switch it really nicely across and score. But yeah, um, it, it was really funny that I remember. So you mentioned this to Gregor, and and Greg was like, "Hey, hey, uh, thought about kick off routine." I was like, "Yeah, man, like <laughs> I saw this stuff. finally I, someone's going to say." I couldn't it. make sense of it like two like a season ago, but like yes, <clears throat> you you can put it together. Uh, and I think thinking about set pieces in in these sort of ways is actually definitely something that you should do. So I had a conversation the other day um, where someone mentioned sort of defending. Co- so like when you attack a corner, you have lots of different routines, right? That makes sense. You vary it up. But when you defend a corner, you you just have one. But when you build a defensive set piece, you're aware that you're prioritizing certain areas and there's going to be weaknesses. So there's, for example, let's say you go, I want to make sure that we're strong at the front post. So we're going to have a weakness, maybe not on the back post, but a bit further back. Or I would like to be strong just around the, the center of the six yard box. So there might be a weakness at the front post or the back post. That's normal. But if you're an opposition team, you just go, that's their routine. I know where their weaknesses are. I know where the, their strong points are. So I'm just going to target the weaknesses. So the conversation that could be had now is, should we actually change our defensive set piece setups from corner to corner, for example, mm. should to surprise the opponent? Yeah. Uh, and when when I thought about that, I went, oh, that's that. It makes complete sense, but I'd never ever thought about it in that mm. way. But I think that you can take set pieces like like kickoff routines. Yeah. Uh, well, or, I, ju- or I should just say, it. that's the interesting thing, isn't it? We're talking about a kickoff as a set piece, which mm. is what Thomas Frank says. I see it as a set yeah. piece. You know, it's like a corner or a free kick. This is a chance to score a goal. It's amazing. A, a reference at the end of the piece as well, one that they did in the championship in their promotion winning year, which was literally like the, the Peter K. John Smith have it advert. They took centre, laid it back to usually uh, Matthias Jen- Jensen. He flicked it up and booted it as high and far into the opposition's uh, third as he possibly could and like this became a bit of a viral thing on 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 the uh, social media it was in the championship so it wasn't quite as kind of widely seen but even then Thomas Frank was saying like it's very hard to defend a high ball and that is always going to be true and what you're doing is you're creating a sort of an opportunity you're also giving when you're kicking it high and nearly like that they're giving the players time to get up the pitch 
and again just swarm and create some an opportunity or like a circumstance that they know they're good at so it, it's all about kind of it just underlines how the depth of thinking mm. and sort of like how how uh and Brentford are often at the vanguard of it they're often kind of the the, the team that, that how do you first. but how would you if you were facing Brentford next week how would you and you were doing the set piece coaching what would you say to counter it that's a good question. I, I the part of me was thinking I would drop quite deep, and almost like, you know, you'd contest the first ball, but you wouldn't give them the space to get in behind, and and you'd almost like, even if they win the first ball, let them have possession in front of you, and make sure they stay in front of you. What the, the what the, what the teams have all done is, is allowed someone to get in behind almost or into the channel either side of the box and get a cross in. So what? So what you're saying? We might see kickoffs where the team with the ball <laughs> kick it all the way back to their goalkeeper, and the opposition team run back towards their goalkeeper. See, yeah, boot it. Come on, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. We've got camped out on the edge of the box. Could you imagine that would be wonderful to watch, wouldn't it? Just two two teams running the opposite I mean, direction. I mean, I've said that. Sod off, pressing. I've said that let's just run off, off the cuff. But no, like, no, I love it. I love as a it defender, as an idea. My instinct is always was always I'd rather the ball be in front of me than behind me. And all these guys, what, what they've allowed to happen is either a really dangerous cross to come in or the ball to go in behind them in the opening 10 seconds of yeah. the game. And then, you know, as a defender, that's unusual too. You saw in both the first two goals, there were like almost chances for the def- the opposition defence to clear it too, but they seemed so flustered by the fact they were defending a cross inside like 15 seconds that they miscued it or it was like, you know, they didn't know what to do. So i just maybe just set off. That's the second ball, I think, that's a, the super dangerous one because the first ball, you expect usually your centre-back to go forward. So that means if you're playing with two centre-backs, one of the centre-backs is going to be isolated. There's going to be space between them and their full-back. So what you want to do is make... Is it either you don't contest that and just let them have it free or you have everyone sort of clustered round ready to win that second ball and then you can counter-attack them mm. because they've overcommitted. Uh, who, had, who had the worst one? The uh, kickoff routine? West Ham. <laughs> West Ham... Played it, you know. There were five, obviously five teams then who tried to keep possession. When there were some of them tried things. So Palace, for example, slipped the ball quickly to Ezzy and said, "Go and run at them." Ezzy's Ezzy's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It didn't work. I think Kobe Mino kind of hustled them out. Uh, but West Ham, they they played, they passed it back. They just kept playing like these tentative sideways passes between the back four. Chelsea didn't even really press them, but gradually sort of cornered them into the right back area. They went back to the goal. They went back to the goalkeeper anyway in the ninth pass. But by this time, Ariola is like on his goal line, mm. so he's kicking from a, this, you know, a position of no, no longer of Complete advantage, weakness, yeah. and he couldn't even reach the halfway line. And it's like you're just immediately on the back foot. So there is, there's always been a an aspect to this. I can't believe we're still talking about. about <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. But there's absolutely always been an aspect. I didn't see it coming. There's always been an aspect to this about laying down a marker as well. Mm. Playing in their half, yeah. playing for territory, almost yep. like you do in rugby. And that's always been true, but now there's just a bit more thought behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Sp- Spurs went straight into their possession phase, like totally on brand. Yeah. And it was just boom, fluid. Yeah. You know what you're okay. getting. Well, we're speaking about tacti- tactical innovations. Absolutely fascinating. I wanted to finish with Pep Guardiola and how he's going to deal with Rodri. Immediately, the narrative is set. They lose Rodri. They drop points. Uh, Alison, I just wanted to finish with a question for you on this topic. Rico Lewis, Mateo Kovacic, Ilkay Gundogan as a midfield three. It's not bad. Um, Team teams have won mm, titles with less, mm, but yeah. trying to pill it into that theme of Liverpool being in there, Chelsea being in there, Arsenal getting a big win at the end. Just kind of you know give us a final summary on what you think about this because when we were talking last week, we talked about that amazing game uh, Arsenal Manchester City, but we didn't know how bad Rodri's injury yeah. was. One week on, those teams have picked up points, those teams have won. City drop points without Rodri. I know it's only six games. I know it's early. I know Arna Slot's rubbish, but what? How do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I said. How do you feel about this title race now? Uh, well, it's got more texture to it, but let's remember, City invariably start poorly. There's all there's this this. I'm getting Groundhog Day vibes now because City are never at their best in their opening six, seven, eight games. So do you want me to do that's... my Gregor impression again? <laughs> City will come. City always come. <laughs> exactly, and but the the I think opposition teams and those hoping for a tilt at the title would be very happy not obviously not happy on a personal level but happy tactically that Rodri isn't available Gundogan is looking less sharp than he did pre 
Barcelona day week year um but that will come back that will come back quickly I'm a huge fan of Kovacic I think people underestimate him so I think he can fil fulfill that role too and Rico Lewis people's still gushing about what a great start he's had under Pep Guardiola so I think I don't I don't I don't, I don't, I don't see a title race where City aren't part of it just because Rodri isn't there they will find a way for those three players who are all individually brilliant but not brilliant at this very second perhaps they will work out a, a balance of how to fulfill that void yeah undoubtedly upcoming Premier League games for Manchester City home to Fulham away to Wolves home to uh, Southampton uh, and away to Bournemouth so if they drop points in those ones then we can really get excited Maybe. about the title race being wide open but a lot more to come before then Alison Rudd, Hamza Kalik Luna and Gregor Robertson thank you very much for joining me we'll be back on Thursday <laughs>